Welcome to this workshop on using drama to teach creativity and critical thinking. Um, now, this workshop is going to be an introduction, a way of getting you familiar with a couple of tools that will help you introduce creativity and critical thinking in the classroom. Um, they work for students of drama as well as any other subject, and the idea here is to make, to give you a toolbox, to give you a number of useful tips based on my experience to integrate these things into a multidisciplinary approach. So, without further ado, let's get started. Um, one very, very quick thing, please. I would kindly ask that cell phones are switched to silent and kept inside your bag or inside your pocket and not on the table. Uh, this is because we have this habit, I have this habit, of taking my phone out and checking messages, and then all of a sudden you need to, you found that somebody sent you something that you want to reply to, and all of a sudden you've missed about five minutes of the workshop. Um, so please, if you could put them away, if you need to respond to something, I would kindly ask you to take it outside. Um, I absolutely can do that, uh, but please feel free to write some notes. There are a couple of things that I would like you to actually write down uh, as we work on some definitions. Um, it's interactive, so feel free to ask questions like this uh, lady has just done. Thank you very much for getting us started with that. Uh, please don't hesitate to stop me and just go question. Um, later on, once we've covered the basics, once we've covered the theoretical aspect, we're going to get up on our feet and do a couple of practical exercises. Um, please don't feel in any way pressured when doing these. It's all about having a bit of fun. It's all about trying it out for yourself and thinking, oh, this is what my students must feel like as learners. Right. Um, any questions? Welcome. Hello, Sahla. Uh, or can I get started? All right, All right. thank you. So, um, who am I and why am I here talking to you? What are my qualifications? Um, my name's Yusuf, by the way. Hi. Um, I've been involved with drama since a very early age. I've been acting since I was five years old. Um, I did a bachelor's degree in theater. My God, that's not loud at all. Um, I did a bachelor's degree in theater, and now I'm working on a master's in education. And one of the things I'm looking at in my master's is how to teach students better critical thinking skills. Uh, this is something that's taken up a lot of my time and something that I'm very interested in. Um, after university, I went to drama school where I actually studied Shakespeare. Um, as cliche as it sounds, and as much as I hate to say it, I'm a classically trained Shakespearean actor. It's what I do. Uh, so I have quite a lot of experience with different theatrical traditions. Um, I've been working as a drama teacher for about 12 years with various age groups, but the bulk of my uh, responsibilities have been with middle schoolers, grades 6 to 10. Um, so if anybody here is an MYP teacher, uh, please do give me a shout out if you have any questions about integrating the MYP into this and I'll be happy to uh, give some advice. Um, I've worked extensively in film, theater, and television. Um, I've been doing stand-up comedy for several years, uh, which is great for me, not so great for you, because I think I'm funny. Sorry, this may become awkward. Um, in terms of my pedigree with the MYP, I've worked as personal project coordinator for several years. I've been the head of the arts department at, the school, at my school, the Amman Baccalaureate. Um, I've also been a moderator and examiner for the IBO. And I'm currently working as a deputy head of school um, at present, but still teaching drama. Uh, because, you know, being a deputy head of school is all about that drama every day. So, what are the big questions that people ask? Is why do we need these things? Why do we need these skills? Why do you need students to have critical thinking skills? Why do they need to be creative? But especially, why do these two things go together? Well, I'm hoping that we'll actually get to an answer about this by the end of this workshop. And I do encourage you to think of your own answers. This is not a cop-out. I'm not trying to say, Oh, uh, well, you can create your own meaning, but to a certain extent, it's true. If you don't come to this 
and at the end of this workshop think, oh, this is something I can use, this is something that I might be able to put into practice, well, fair enough. That's you, that's up to you, that's your process and that's your journey. If it does, if this does give you an insight into how critical thinking and creativity are good things, well then fantastic, I'll be very happy. So why do we need critical thinking? I'll give you four examples. Is anyone familiar with any of these four people? No? Lady up top, left hand corner? No? Okay, so this lady up here is Kellyanne Conway. Um, if you've been following the American election recently, uh, she is a spokesperson for the Trump administration. She became very, very famous when Donald Trump was first elected during his inauguration. Um, there were a bunch of photos circulating of the field where people, it's called the mall, where people gather in order to watch the inauguration. And it was clear that comparing the photos from Trump's inauguration to other presidents' inauguration, that there were very few people there. Conway went on the news to argue that no, there were in fact lots of people there. There were more people there than ever before. And when she was very specifically told that the facts don't support this, she said, well, the president is using alternative facts. That's a very, very scary idea. The fact that people out there will actually say, oh, yes, you have your facts, but I have mine. You have your reality, but my reality is different. That's a bit of a scary idea, that somebody might say that, oh, you might think one plus one equals two, but that's just your opinion. I disagree. This gentleman over here with the curly hair, his name is David Avocado Wolf. You might have seen him on Facebook. You might have shared one of his memes. They're usually pretty pictures of nature, of people who are standing around saying very inspirational things like, some people want a Ferrari and a million dollars in the bank. I just want to live out in nature and be happy. You must have seen them. Somebody must have shared them. He sounds harmless enough, except he's not. This man believes that the earth is flat. No joke. He actually believes the earth is flat. He believes mushrooms are alien to earth. Again, this is not a joke. This is what he seriously says. And what he does, what he sells through his page on Facebook and through his website is cures for cancer that don't work. This man preys on vulnerable and scared people who have been diagnosed with cancer, gives them the promise that I can make you whole again, I can cure you without you needing to go see a doctor. And he sells them false hope, and these people inevitably will die a slow and painful death because he has no morals. And I'm sorry that this is very, very heavy stuff, but this is the sort of world that we live in. These are the sorts of people who prey on us, on our children, on our communities. These are the people who will take advantage of someone's inability to think critically in order to turn it to their own means, in order to make a profit. Um, I'll just hang on to this gentleman last and skip the very last one. His name's Andrew Wakefield. He's the guy who about 15 years ago, sorry, no, longer, maybe 20 years ago, started the idea that vaccines cause childhood autism. Have you heard of that? As a result of a fraudulent study that is factually incorrect, he lost his license, the study was retracted, and yet still, 20 years later, people still think that he was onto something. Recently in Romania, a place where there has been a huge anti-vaccine movement, thanks to him, there was a huge outbreak of measles, and something in the area of 147 children died from contracting measles. All thanks to him. Take a second to think about that. Take a second to think about 
the type of world we live in, about the nature of some of the people we live with, who are willing to do horrible things to make a name for themselves, who are willing to take advantage of people in order to turn a profit. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we need good critical thinkers. That is why we as teachers have a responsibility to get our students ready to face a world like this so that they are not taken in by individuals like these. Right, let's move on to something a little happier. Let's start off by trying to define critical thinking. What is it? Now there's a lot of definitions out there um, and I've chosen two in particular that I'd like to focus on. The first one is by a lady named Linda Elder. Um, she's one of the co-founders of a, um, a foundation called the Critical Thinking Foundation. You can find them online. They have a lot of very, very interesting resources. Um, I'm not entirely sure how amazing many of the resources are. I've only looked at a few of them. But a very interesting individual with a lot of interesting ideas. She says that critical thinking is self-guided. It's self-disciplined thinking, which attempts to reason at the highest level of quality in a fair-minded way. That's a very good definition I've found. Um, it's a lot to unpack. So I have this other definition underneath it, which I think summarizes that nicely. And this is the definition, I'm not ashamed to say, from Google. Why Google? Well, Every time you ask your students to look something up, this is exactly the definition that, that, that will come up for them. Like it or not, the very first instinct that students have these days is to pop open the laptop, plug in the question, what is critical thinking, into Google, and that's what they'll get. But despite that, I think this is actually a pretty decent definition. Critical thinking is the objective analysis and evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. Analysis, evaluation, and judgment. And let's, uh, sorry, objective analysis and evaluation. Let's hold that in there for a second, and we'll come back to it a little bit later on. So when it comes to creating critical thinkers, when it comes to fostering critical thinking, it's really not something that you can do if you're not honest with yourself. One of the main things about being a critical thinker is turning your eye inward and looking at yourself. And that's why I have this disclaimer up here. Everything I'm saying in this workshop could be wrong. And that's a fact that I'm okay with. Everything I tell you here might not work for you. You might walk out of here thinking, well, oh my God, that guy was full of crap. That's possible and that's fine. You might find out that these things that I'm telling you have no basis in actual science. I'm okay with that. If you can prove this wrong, great, because that means you're being a critical thinker. Everything that I'm going to present to you after this slide is based on my own personal experience. It's based on my biased experience of life. It's based on my various backgrounds in the performing arts. Some of these exercises might work for some of you. One of them might work for all of you. Some of them might work with one group of children one year, and it might be fantastic, and it might be magical, and they might love it and learn so much from it. And the next year, or several months later, a different group of students will think, well, this is terrible. I don't know why we're doing this. That's OK. What I promise you is that I've done my best to put together a good program. I've done my best to give you a distillation of what I know, and now I give it to you guys, and the rest is in your hands. It sounds pretty deep, doesn't it? Sorry, I should have been a motivational speaker. I'm in the wrong business. So, let's define creativity. We're going to do a very, very small and simple activity. What I'd like you to do, please, is very quickly, shuffle around and go and talk to somebody you don't know, someone you haven't met before. All right? I know it's a bit of a socially awkward thing to do, but go for it. It's the end of the day. Come on, what have you got to lose? Pick a partner. 
And I want you to spend three minutes talking to each other and finding out what your partner does, who they are, what they do, what their thing is, what do they teach, right? Why are they here? Just very quickly, a couple of snippets about this person. And then I'm going to call on you to explain to us what your partner does. One caveat, I want you to do it in a creative manner. And what that means, what creative means, well, that's up to you to decide. What's a creative way of passing on information to people? You tell me. Any questions? All right, three minutes on the clock, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hustle, 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 and find somebody we don't know. Go! And in five, four, three, two, one, and let's kindly get our focus back together. Right. Thank you. That looks like it was quite a conversation. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's actually get started. Um, I'm going to pick on you and ask that you tell me about your partner. Um, ladies, you drew my attention by asking me a question, so go. Very quickly. Jump in. Improvise if you need to. Um, it's up to you. If you want to speak in Arabic, that's absolutely great. Would you like a microphone? <laughs> it's up to you. So long as it's creative, by your definition, go for it. I'm putting you on the spot. You're doing a great job. Thank you. For the problem we have today, uh, please start. I don't know. She's a teacher. She's a, teacher. Maybe she's a science teacher. <laughs> All right. She's a teacher. She's not a science teacher. Okay. But she's a teacher. Yeah, well, that's pretty creative. Yes, we're actually being asked to think about something. An English teacher, I hear from over there. Maybe. Yes, English teacher. All right, an English teacher who teaches kids how to write. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to return the favor to your partner? Okay, I'll, I'll ease off on you. Let's have a couple more people. Ladies, would you like to give it a try? All right, lovely. Thank you very much. Thinking about it in terms of what brings you together, what you have in common. Well, you're talking, so of course I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> Go ahead. Bil Arabi command, it's fine. Come on, you can do it. Keep it creative, yes. <laughs> so, so you're thinking visually about creating that. That's beautiful. You should have actually done that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, who else? I haven't had anybody. Please, go ahead. This is Ayat. She works at uh, AIS as a grade one and two teacher. Um, she majored in English and English teacher. And she's learned a lot in the last few years she's been teaching. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a much better PowerPoint than mine. Please, go ahead. Would you guess what her name is? Uh, Candle snail? Something like Well done. <laughs> you will never be able to guess. Just tell them the story behind the, the name. Stop cheating. <laughs> well done. Um, can we have somebody from our last table over here. It's a 50-50 split, guys. One of you is going to have to go. Could we please listen? All right. Anything else? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to present somebody that I met. Um, and again, since this is about being creative and it's about taking risks, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do something that's going to make me look very, very stupid. Her name is Rana, <laughs> KG principal. She loves to travel around the world, has a little dog named Micah too. <laughs> and that's just one more way to do it. You can do it in a song, you can do it in a dance. There is literally no limit to the number of ways you can present a piece of information to people. And to a certain extent, this is what we call creativity. So, now that we've seen all these different ways of presenting it, do we have a definition for it? What is being creative? What is doing something in a different manner? What is being creative? Does anybody have something that they'd like to throw out here? Please? Thinking outside the box, that's a very good one. Do something that is abnormal or not normal, something that's out of the ordinary. Very good. Anything else? Something that's unexpected. Very good. These are actually really good definitions of creativity. Some, to, be, to be unique? Absolutely. These are very good definitions. And in fact, I think you'll find that a couple of these are things that are already up there. An idea that isn't ordinary. Is that creativity? Is it finding a different way to do something? Is it originality, innovation, newness? These could all be definitions for creativity, but essentially that I think sort of sums it up. It's about doing something in a different way, in a way that people don't expect. Good. What I'd like you to do is just take a minute, think of your own definition. How would you as a teacher, as somebody who has done this for many years, how do you define creativity? And please, jot down a couple of ideas, please. And when you're ready, we can move on to the next part. All right. So let's get to the meat of it. 
We've defined critical thinking, we've defined creativity. Now we're going to start going into how these two can work together in a classroom context. Now, hopefully as we go through the following exercises, you're going to find that there's a bit of a link between these two. It's easy to integrate critical thinking when you're doing creativity and vice versa. Um, it's very, very simple to develop them both in a dramatic context. Um, if any of you are teaching the MYP, the whole idea of being creative and then thinking critically about it in order to improve your process, that's the inquiry cycle. You've seen that a million times. It's come across. It's the basis of pretty much all in, the MYP and the PYP is all about that inquiry. It's about that cycle of what happened? What do I want to know? What action am I going to take? And how do I think about it to make it go better? Great thing about doing it in the context of drama is it makes it fun and it makes it a challenge. And that's at the heart of the entire concept of gamification. When a student is doing something where they feel like, oh wow, this is a lot of fun, I'm enjoying this. When they're perhaps competing with others in a bit of friendly rivalry, thinking, oh, I can do this, I can do this better, I can do that. It really makes for a very different sort of learning experience. It's no longer sitting down in a classroom going, it gives them the ability to take charge. It allows them to become active learners. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a fantastic acting tool, improvisation. Um, just very quickly, how can a person be creative? What does it take to be creative? What do you need in order to get up there and let your creativity flow? Well. One of the things is, don't be afraid to test your limits. We often are our worst enemies. We start thinking, oh no, I, I can't do that. That's, that's scary for me. No, 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 I, please, you go, you go. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm okay here. Please, let, start with somebody else. We worry about this, and it's normal. It's a great idea to listen to your instincts. This is something especially... Um, that actors are encouraged to do. Go with your gut. Sometimes you will come up with things that won't land, that people won't recognize, they won't understand. But every so often, you're going to come out with something brilliant. You're going to come up with something that will engage people, that will make them laugh, that will make them think, wow, that was amazing. Be confident, and if you can't be confident, fake it. Oh, yes, absolutely. Ah, oh, you have no idea. I am shaking and sweating like crazy. Um, faking it is easy. All you need to do is pretend like you're confident. It's acting a role. And that is really a very useful skill. It's not as easy as being confident in reality, but hold on to that thought because I'm getting to it in the next slide. Be honest. When you're going to be creative, be true to yourself. If there's something you like, go for it. If there's an idea, we often do this. We think, oh no, this is something that I like. Nobody else is going to enjoy it. It's something personal to me. <sighs> She's not going to like the things that I like. She's not going to find them interesting. But here's the thing. There's a funny little thing that has to do with you doing things that you like, that you're passionate about. It's that this passion is contagious. People are going to feel your enthusiasm and it's going to bite them and they're going to get drawn in and they're going to think, wow, that's, I've never thought about this before. I've never had anybody explain this to me with such interest and with such passion. And finally, you do need to confront your insecurities. And going back to the point that this gentleman uh, just brought up, we're all insecure. Have you ever heard the expression, uh, humans are 70% water, essentially we're cucumbers with anxiety? It's, it's brilliant, we are. We're just, we're just bags of water and emotions. And um, I, I really like this quote about self-doubt, because we all have it. None of us are born as natural performers. None of us are born confident people. 
Even the most confident people you see, deep down inside, have the exact same insecurities that everybody else does. It's universal. People are riddled with doubt. It is the engine that drives them through their lives. It is the elastic band in the little model airplane of their soul. And they spend their time winding it up into knots. We allow our self-doubt to become bigger than it is. We keep revving it. We keep making it take us over. That's what anxiety is, essentially. It's us making our self-doubt bigger than what it is. But the thing to remember is everybody has doubts. Everybody, no exception. The most confident people have self-doubt. The least confident people have self-doubt. And by the way, if there are any English teachers in here, Terry Pratchett, a fantastic author, uh, one of the greatest writers and philosophers of our time, and he does it all by creating incredibly ridiculous scenarios uh, in a fantasy setting. Um, absolutely amazing. So once we recognize that deep down we're all the same, we all have the same hang-ups, then we can start to realize that, you know what? I'm not that different. It doesn't matter if I'm worried about getting up on stage. So what? So's the other person. So's this person. It's all about taking that risk. IB Learner profile link, risk taker. People fear failing. They worry that I'm going to get up there and I'm going to mess up. They worry about being misunderstood. Oh, what if people think this, but I mean this? They suffer from anxiety. They worry about worrying. They worry about getting up there. And they're worried about people judging them and thinking, that's not good. You're terrible. You're not funny. And it's a scary thing, having somebody judge you and reduce you to that one moment. And all these factors can affect someone's ability to speak up and be creative. So here's where you come in as a teacher. Anytime you want to introduce these skills, anytime you want to introduce these exercises, you need to create a, a space that's free of ridicule. And this can be a bit tough because people like to knock other people down to feel better about themselves. We all do it. With teenagers, they're even more susceptible to this, and they do it more to each other. They're their worst enemies. They constantly are plagued with doubts, and they're constantly looking for somebody to validate them, to say, you know what? You're not terrible. So you need to create a, free spa a space that's free of ridicule, a safe space. Make them understand that no matter what, you're not allowed to make fun of somebody, ever. Make the conversation critical, but not judgmental. So don't judge the person, judge the work. And sometimes when it comes to this, when it comes to drama, it's very difficult to make that distinction. For you as a teacher giving feedback and also for the student, because the student is getting up there and they're doing their best, they're giving it their all. They're trying to make you laugh based on who they are. So the criticism can be a bit biting. So make sure it's always about the work. Fear is a big one. Now, imagine you're about to go up on stage or you're about to present in front of a room full of people. What are you feeling? Anybody been up presenting something recently? What did it feel like? Yeah. The feeling, the butterflies in your stomach, that, that discomfort here. Your heart rate is through the roof, blood rushing into your head, red cheeks. Your shoulders tend to migrate up by millimeter by millimeter until you look like Quasimodo from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Sanctuary. Um, you need to go to the toilet every three minutes. Yeah? You forget your name. Your palms are sweaty, you, 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 you start talking really, really quickly because you just want to, hi, how's it going? <laughs> and you start tripping over yourself. What if I told you that this isn't fear? What if I told you that this is just a normal response to danger that we have, but we like to label it, we like to give it a name. And once we call it fear, it becomes this very scary thing that we need to struggle with. But what if I were to tell you that this was just 
the result of the hormone adrenaline. Any science teachers in here? Biologists? Yes. Very quickly, what does adrenaline do? It makes your heart rate. Increases your heart rate. Exactly. It's, it's a danger response hormone. It's something that served our species for hundreds of thousands of years. When every time you come across something dangerous, the adrenaline starts pumping. It makes your heart rate go up. You start breathing more. It floods your body with sugar. The blood goes to your muscles and not to your stomach. It cuts it off from the digestive system, which is why you feel the butterflies in your stomach. That's because your body's diverting the blood to the muscles that are going to help you either wrestle that tiger to the ground and kill it or run away from it as fast as you can. It's priming your body to do the best job that it possibly can. That's adrenaline. And that's what people are feeling before they go up on stage, before they present. So they're not afraid. It's a normal response. And once you start intellectualizing that, it helps. Tell your students you're not afraid. Your body is getting ready to do the best job it possibly can. So use that energy and get out there and kick some butt. Encourage people to learn from their mistakes. That's a big one. We learn well by failing. Failure is a great teacher. Getting up there, messing up, not being able to do something right, great. Next time, fail better. Do it again, learn from it. It doesn't matter if you mess up, it's normal. Everybody makes mistakes. What matters is that you turn it into a learning opportunity. Oh, I, a bit, of a, a bit of a tangent, but I used to be the child in school who sat at the back of the class and refused to raise their hand or answer a question. My biggest fear was that the teacher would call on me and ask me to say something. I was terrified. And I was also not funny. Um, I tried, as I, as I grew older, I used to think that I could shield my insecurities with humor. So I used to make a lot of jokes, which nobody found funny. And my friends were horrible people. They destroyed me. They, they absolutely ripped me to shreds every time I made a joke and made me feel horrible because they said, you're not funny. Um, but slowly but surely through also the great encouragement of my wife, who is one of my harshest critics. Uh, and she's fantastic because she made me somebody who is able to get up and be a stand-up comedian. Because she's ruthless. She'll tell you that's not funny. Uh, I think all these factors have actually helped me learn. They've, um, they've improved my sense of humor a lot, which you're not really seeing here today, I think. But um, yeah, I think... For, a man walks into a bar. Ouch. Thank you. But yeah, it's a success story for me, but again, remember my disclaimer at the beginning. This is all based on my own bias and my own journey. So it may not work for everybody. It might work for you. Maybe not me. Or vice versa. So, offer support and feedback every time somebody's getting up there, every time somebody's pushing themselves to do something that they're not comfortable with, support them. Tell them that they did a good job. Thank them for the effort. It really goes a long way. But sometimes, you just have to throw them in the deep end. Sometimes you will come across a student who is so terrified to try out something new that they will not get up on their own, no matter how long you leave them. Sometimes, the best thing to do for that student is to get them up there and say, go. And don't let them sit back down until they've done it. Even if they do what they feel is the worst job ever, so long as they've done it, so long as they've broken that barrier, give them the support, tell them, well done. You did it. You crossed that threshold. And that usually will break it, will break that fear. And they'll be able to do it with more confidence as time goes by. This is also, these are also great ideas for when giving critical feedback. Remember this. Make sure that the feedback is not one of ridicule, where you're not being judgmental. Very good way to do it.
So now we've reached the end of the theory. We're going to move on to the actual practical aspects, and I'm going to ask you guys to get up a bit and move around. I know it's a scary concept. I can see by the look on your face. Oh God, why? Um, before we move on, do we have any questions? We're good? Wonderful. I'm either a great teacher or you guys just don't get it. Um, so, the first exercise we're going to do, this is fantastic for big groups if you have some space. Um, it's absolutely wonderful because it doesn't put a lot of pressure on individuals. It's great for groups and an individual student doesn't feel like they're under a lot of pressure to perform. It's safe. It's non-threatening, and it's a nice physical activity to get people up on their feet. So basically, what I'm going to ask you to do is to get up, and not right now, um, in that empty area over there, which the lovely people at the Hyatt painstakingly created for us, I'm going to ask you to walk around. Uh, it's important to remember that you don't walk around in a circle, because that's inevitably what happens. The herd mentality kicks in and we all end up going in a circle, moving in the same direction. We don't want that. We want people to move at random. And I'm going to throw out some prompts to you. I'm going to say, okay, for example, you've just run into somebody at a family reunion who you don't really like. And every time you make eye contact with somebody, you have to treat them that way, as if they're a relative of yours that you don't really like? Or what if there's somebody that you absolutely love, a long-lost friend? What if it's somebody you have a crush on, but you're too scared to tell them? Try that out. We're going to get you guys moving around, and let's see how that feels. So, if you could kindly make your way to that space. And go back to walking, and go back to walking, and go back to walking, and walk, and walk, and walk, and don't talk, and walk, and move around, and listen, and listen, and listen, and walk around. We're back to walking, back to walking, back to moving. All right, the next person that you're going to lay eyes on is actually somebody who you're very, very closely related to, but you don't like them very much. So you need to say hi. You absolutely have to say hi, but you don't really like them too much. Good, and once you've found somebody, move on to the next person. Good, be cold, be cool to them. Oh, I don't like you very much, but I have to because it's etiquette. Good, and keep moving once you've done that. Keep moving, keep walking. Good, wonderful. And continue walking and keep walking in the space and keep moving. Don't stand still, ladies and gentlemen, keep moving. Next person you meet, Next person you make eye contact with is somebody you're desperate to impress. Maybe it's your boss, maybe it's a member of your family whose approval you seek, but you want to impress them, you want to be super nice to them. The next person you make eye contact with, be specially nice to them. And move on to the next person, and move on to the next person. Find somebody new, find somebody new, keep it moving. Good, 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 keep it moving. And relax, and relax, and relax. Well done, ladies and gentlemen, very, very well done. Give yourselves a round of applause, thank you. Um, I'm just going to jump up while you're still standing there and move on to the next slide. Uh, no, 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 stay there. All right. Actually, I think considering the number, we can do this from our seats. Please, have a seat. You've earned a break.
So that was our very first creative exercise. Um, I'm going to hold off on the feedback for a moment until we're done with the next one. Um, this was a very good one as well. This one works literally anywhere with pretty much any age group. Uh, and it's fantastic, especially if you don't have a lot of space in your room. It's called World's Worst. And the premise is very simple. You get your audience or you get your students, or you can suggest it, uh, to suggest a location or a situation or a profession. Very, very simple. Can I have a profession, a job, something that's not teacher? Sorry? Dentist, lawyer, let's go with dentist. The medical profession is always great. The idea is simple. What you need to do is to think of the worst dentist in the world. Right? Somebody who is so utterly terrible at their job. And I want you to think of something that the world's worst dentist would say or do. And exaggeration is the name of the game here. Because the more exaggerated it is, the more crazy and out there it is, the funnier it is. So, give me a suggestion. What could the world's worst dentist say? Yes. Oops, it's the wrong tooth. Fantastic. They took out the wrong tooth. Excellent. What else? Faddali, <laughs> walihimmik. Very good. Fantastic. World's worst dentist. Great. What else? What else could the world's worst dentist say to you or do? Anybody? Yes. Excellent. You have very ugly teeth. Beautiful. Fantastic. Excellent. One more. Could you do me a massive favor and just get up and show us what that would look like by miming it? Just show us a doctor with no concept of hygiene. Wonderful, thank you. The only feedback that I would give you, especially if you're running this exercise with your students, is ask them to show it instead of explaining it. Because that's really what you want them to do. They've got the idea, but now it's about the expression and the communication of it. So that was fantastic. A filthy dentist, somebody who might come in, I'm sure you have seen this before, the... <laughs> Okay, what do we have here? Say, ah. <laughs> Excellent. Let's have another, let's, let's go for a lawyer. I like that. World's worst lawyer. What could the world's worst lawyer say or do on their first day? Or, well, what would the world's worst lawyer sound like? Yes? You stay in the prison all your life. Great. You're going to jail for the rest of your life. Goodbye. Excellent. Fantastic. What else? Uh, he did it. Great. He did it. Oh, he's my client. Sorry. No. Great. Yes. What else? World's worst lawyer. What do you want, not want a lawyer to say? I'm sorry, but this is my first experience. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is my first experience. Excellent. What else? More than 5,000 JD. <laughs> Great, this piece of paper will cost you more than 5,000 JD. Fantastic. My, my client only kills people when he's drunk. Great, my client only kills people when he's drunk. Excellent, something you don't want your lawyer to say. I'm sorry, I can't come to the court today. I'm sorry, I can't come to court today. Excellent. Great, ladies and gentlemen, these are fantastic. 
These are ideas that are very, very funny. And the, I, the whole concept of this exercise is to get the students to think in a, quote, unquote, creative manner. You're coming up with something by taking it to the extreme. You're pushing it to a point where it becomes a parody, where it becomes a little bit crazy. World's worst lawyer, world's worst dentist. And then you can start building on it. You can look at a situation. For example, um, worst thing to say or do at a funeral. Mabrook. Agbal Indak. Daimi. Yeah, I did that once. That's a little close to home. Um, and that is a great exercise. It's fantastic for coming up with writing prompts, especially. Um, it needs absolutely no preparation whatsoever. It's great for a few laughs. And especially when you've got a more cohesive group, for example, a class that's been together for a while, they're going to know a little bit more where to take the humor of it. It's a great icebreaker. It's fantastic for getting them thinking in different ways. Um, so yeah, world's worst. It's an absolutely brilliant one. I love it. All right, one more, and then we'll actually look at giving critical feedback. How are we doing for time? Good. So, this one's a bit more physical, and I'm going to ask you to stretch yourself a little bit. Um, but considering the large number of people we have, maybe we can do it in just smaller groups. Basically, what you do here is you think spatially as well. The idea is this. You divide your class into a number of groups, and you give these groups a mission. I want this group using only their physicality, using only their bodies, no props, you don't get to use bottles of water or chairs or anything. I want you to create a machine on stage. This machine can be anything you can think of. It could be a fire truck. It could be an airplane. It could be a washing machine, a fridge, a printer. The idea here is to get the students to think in very, very oblique lateral terms. How can a bunch of people approximate this kind of movement or this kind of function? And it's a very, very challenging one to do. Now, it's pretty out there, so I'm going to ask you, would you guys like to try it out? One person would. Maybe two. All right, two people. Come on, all right. Well, can I have a group of maybe four or five volunteers? Come on, get up, yes. Give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Make them feel happy. Yes, wonderful, thank you. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> I understand, we have an access issue. All right, so, let's give them a machine to approximate. What's, what's a very, very common machine that we see on a daily basis? Something that isn't a car. A mobile phone might be a bit difficult. It's a good idea, but it might be a little bit difficult because, hmm, you know what? No, that's actually a very good idea. Okay, guys, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, and I want the four of you to become a mobile phone. All right? It's a bit crazy, but think of what phones look like nowadays. Hint, hint. Big screen, lots of apps. That's not unlocking for some reason, but yeah. Takes pictures, lots of moving things in it, okay? How it looks and what it does. How it looks and what it does, all right? You will become the phone. Start thinking. Now in the meantime, I'm going to distract you so they don't feel very pressured. Look at me, everybody. I'm going to move over here. Hello, yes. Let's take the pressure off them for a bit so that they don't feel like everybody's watching them. Let's all watch me instead, because that's not intimidating. Um, the idea behind this is, again, you're forcing students to think in ways that they have never done before. Nobody really thinks, how can I become a phone? Nobody ever thinks, how can I become a chair or a washing machine or a dump truck or a cement mixer? Again, it's about pushing the boundaries of what thinking they're used to do. They're used to doing, sorry. It's about doing something different. 
It's about using their bodies in the space, which is something that most of us are not familiar with. So it's definitely taking you out of your comfort zone. You're definitely being a risk taker. You're definitely being a thinker. Um, and ooh, it looks like we're getting ready. Uh, are you guys ready? All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a look. Okay, if we could please pay attention to the people on the stage. Are you guys done? Give them a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. That was excellent. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, with this particular exercise, um, what you can do is you can put the students into groups, into teams, and they can compete against each other. Uh, three or four groups of about five to six students is ideal. It can work with slightly larger groups or slightly smaller ones. And what you do is you help them to compete. One point for the best one, or maybe two points for the best one, one point for the runner-up. See how it goes. They're going to start getting a bit more motivated to try it out. It's a great exercise. All right. So, let's start talking about feedback. Let's start talking about the critical thinking aspect. How do you make people think critically? And this is where it really comes in. You remember the um, definition that we were working from originally? Critical thinking is the objective analysis and evaluation of an issue in order to form a judgment. And remember, we highlighted three words, objective, analysis, and evaluation. Let's start off with being objective. What does objective mean, really? No biases. No biases. Very good. What sort of biases do we have? What sort of biases do we carry with us when we walk into a space or a learning experience? Anybody? that my way is the correct way, gender, that's a beautiful one. That's a wonderful bias. We are very, very conditioned to think in terms of gender, in terms of, oh yeah, that's a woman's job or that's a man's job. That's a very, very good one, yes. That's a really good one. We always expect our high achievers to do better. And sometimes that, that backfires because we will either give them praise where it's not deserved or be extra harsh on them or we might not recognize the excellent work of other students because we're just focused on these high flyers. That is an excellent bias. That is fantastic. Anything else? Sometimes some students who have behavioral issues generally <coughs> tend to be biased. Absolutely. When you think of a kid, we do this, regardless of whether or not we like to admit it. We all have this at some level. Oh, this is a bad kid. This is a troublemaker. We, yeah. Absolutely. You make those familial connections, those familial biases. Oh yeah, I had their sibling a few years ago. That sibling was either amazing or they were terrible. Why can't you be more like the good kid? Why can't you be better than the bad kid? It's a it's very tricky, dangerous ground. Yes. So once you've started thinking about your biases, then you start thinking about your expectations. So what do I want these students to be able to do? And by the way, these questions not only work for you as a teacher, they work for the students giving the feedback, for the students being critical thinkers. They need to think about their biases. They need to think about their expectations. What is it you want the student to achieve? 
Then we go to being analytical. What is the purpose of the exercise? Why did we do it? What's the point? And that sort of feeds back to expectations. Think about your own points, the things that you're saying, the feedback that you're giving. Are they really valid? Or am I just speaking because I feel the need to? Is my opinion actually correct? Is it valid? Is it helpful? That's a big question. Am I giving them something that they can use or is it just automatic? Am I on autopilot and just saying things for the sake of saying them? And finally, we come down to the evaluation aspect. And these are three questions that are very, very useful and pretty universal. What was good and why? What was missing? What could have been better and why and what was missing? The why is very important because it's through that why that we begin the process of critical thinking. Are you familiar with the principle of Socratic questioning? Well, essentially there was this guy named Socrates and he asked a lot of questions. And that was his way of understanding the world around him. By, con by continuously and unceasingly asking questions. Why do you think so? Why do you hold that opinion? Why was that good? So if we were, for example, to look at the wonderful um, mobile phone that we had up here, if we were to give our opinion of it, what would, what would anybody say? Give us a judgment. What did you think of the mobile phone? Come on, you can do it. Sorry? They worked as a team. Is that a good thing? Why? I'm sorry, it's a very difficult question to answer, isn't it? Why is teamwork good? We just take these values as a given. Yes, teamwork is good. But think about it. Why? Support each other, okay. Okay, so everybody's participating and taking part in the process. Yes, very good. Be careful of those biases, the weak student, the clever students. Okay, so you're looking at, sorry, yes. Producing momentum, using a number of different skills. Yes, these are all good things. What else? Okay, reliance on others, and that's the importance of teamwork. Very good. And you two ladies? They met the expectations and what was required of them, yes? Yeah, they learned management skills, essentially, self-management. Yes, sir. It's breaking down barriers, giving them the social skills if we're ATL-minded. Yes, and these are all excellent ex examples and excellent explanations. But the thing to remember is, you can always go further. You can always question further. You can always ask, why? It's a very, very simple technique. Why is it important for these students to acknowledge each other? How does that help them? You could say, well, when they're doing that, they're building a closer social network. We're removing the prejudices that these people have. They collaborate better. They learn how to work as a team. It reduces conflict. And you can come up with a hundred different reasons why it's a good thing. But that first time somebody asks you, why is that a good thing? It's a tough threshold to go over. And I mean, we're teachers. We've been doing this for decades. There's probably a good 200 years worth of experience in this room. And yet, that first why, that's a tough one. That's a tough one to get over. So just imagine what it must be like for a student who's never been called on to answer that question, who's never been called on to say, why is that important? 
It really opens up a lot of perspectives. Right. We've got about 19 minutes and two exercises, which I'll explain to you. Um, and we might have a stab at this one. Um, so this one's called press conference. Um, this is really, really useful if you have maybe one student who's incredibly confident, who's a bit of a high flyer, somebody who's really good at improvising, um, and you'll need a couple of other students with them. The idea is simple. The minister is here to present a press conference. And they're being asked questions by the reporters who are other students. You give the minister a, um, a silly ministry to be in charge of. For example, the Ministry of Silly Walks, if you're a Monty Python fan. And what they need to do is answer questions as professionally as possible. Of course, you're going to encourage the students to ask them difficult questions that they may not be able to answer, that they should not, for example, be able to answer. Um, an example of this question could be, and how exactly is the Ministry of Silly Walks helping to reduce global warming at this stage? That's a very difficult question to answer. And the person is going to have to think on their feet and come up with a comeback. Well, clearly, um, the Ministry of Silly Walks is invested heavily in people walking instead of using cars. And of course, the more people walk around, even if it's in a silly manner, um, the less consumption of fossil fuels we're going to have due to transport, and the lower the carbon footprint for individual people will be, and that is how we are helping reduce global warming. It's a really, really good one when you have a student who is quick on their feet, um, who is maybe confident, and it's great for getting other people involved in, answering, in asking pretty difficult questions. Um, again, great for a few laughs, builds confidence, and it's also a pretty good way to tackle real life issues. It's great for a writing prompt if you want to think about, if you want to dis discuss politics as well. Uh, it's a very useful one. Um, this one is great for, I see you've, you're familiar with the skit. Um, this is a great exercise for teaching build up. Um, now, build up is very much a dramatic comic skill. Uh, but it works in a bunch of different avenues as well, especially, again, if you're teaching writing, if you're teaching performance, poetry, public speaking, it's great. You need to be able to build something up to get to the maximum, to get to that climax, and keep your audience engaged. This is a great exercise for that. It's built on a um, comedy sketch by, again, Monty Python, uh, called The Four Yorkshiremen. Um, basically, these are four men who had very humble beginnings. They started off very poor, having almost nothing. And they're meeting again 30 years later to discuss how wonderful life is. And one of them starts to reminisce. They start to think, oh, when I was a young man, we didn't have any of this. We used to live in a terrible, terribly small house. And it starts like that. It starts as a game of one-upmanship. The next person wants to tell them that, oh, your life was bad, but mine was worse. Oh, you had a house. Oh, well, you're lucky to have a house. We lived in a single room, all 15 of us. And then the third person is going to jump in. Oh, you had a room, that's nice. We used to have to live in a hole in the ground. There were 20 of us. Oh, you had a hole in the... I wish I had a hole in the ground. I had to live at the bottom of the lake. And so on and so forth. And they start building it. And the lie gets progressively bigger. And it can be done based on any kind of scenario. Say, for example, four people who want to get into a doctor's office. Uh, four people come in with relatively minor injuries that start getting bigger and bigger. One person comes in having maybe cut themselves shaving. It starts off as a slight cut, and then all of a sudden, the blood is gushing, and they're dying, falling down on the floor. Somebody might come in with a bit of a sniffle, and then all of a sudden, they're dying of the plague, and so on and so forth. It's about that buildup. It's about 
taking things slowly but surely further and further. And then maybe even breaking the barrier of what is logical and going beyond that. So that's five exercises that I've found are very, very helpful. Um, again, this is not meant to be an exhaustive explanation of what you can do with drama in a classroom setting. It's just a taster. It's just a number of small tools that you can use on a daily basis in order to build that creativity and build that critical thinking. Please explore further. There's so much more out there. These are just a couple of things that you can tool around, you can mess with them, you can change things, swap things out, and keep them fresh all the time. Explore, see what happens. As a final summary, just go and cover the main, the main bits. Now, critical thinking and creativity are important skills that can be transferred into almost any context. Training others to be critical thinkers requires us to think critically as well, be honest about our shortcomings. Objectivity, analysis, and making judgments are central to the idea of critical thinking. They're at the heart. Try your best to create a safe environment for the exchange of ideas and opinions. And make it fun, and the kids won't even realize they're learning. Um, that, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty much the end of it, and I'd very happily like to open up the next five to ten minutes for questions, anything you'd like to ask, anything you'd like to try out, any advice, uh, or any personal experiences that you'd like to share with us. Uh, thank you very much. So, here comes the hard part. Now it's your turn. Any questions, anything about what we've covered? Don't all jump up at once. Is there anything anybody would like a bit of clarification on, any of the games? No? Uh, any personal experiences where you think this worked or might have worked? Where this might have been useful or where you'd like to try it? Please. I just want to say that these uh, were really beautiful ideas and you can use them uh, as English teachers uh, for writing and speaking. But I was wondering how I can use such things for grammar because you know grammar is kind of like you know it's tough for all the teachers. What uh, what age groups do you usually work with? Uh, Fourteen. Okay, so ninth, tenth graders. Okay. Um, Well, I mean, off the top of my head, one of the suggestions would be um, just making sure that the students are working to keep their grammar up as they're doing it. If you're introducing a, um, for example, if you were to do the prime minister's press conference, the minister's press conference, sorry. Uh, let's say you're introducing a new concept in grammar, say gerunds. Um, then make sure that all questions are use a gerund. Um, make sure that the answers need to... Well, I understand yeah. what I said to myself maybe in mm. Exactly. So you can control, I mean, you can specify one particular aspect of it um, that you can use. Um, another very good one for English teachers is a game called 60 Second Alphabet. Um, you're, you're going to have to write out the alphabet uh, somewhere visible because otherwise the students are going to be going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, which is going to waste a lot of time. It's a challenge. The idea is this. Students, again, you pick a location for them to be in. Two students go up, and they need to have a conversation around this theme, but every time they start a sentence, they need to start with that particular letter of the alphabet. So the conversation will start with the letter A, then B, then C, then D, then E and F, and they want to try and get through the entire alphabet within 60 seconds. They will rarely ever do this uh, because it's a very difficult one, so you might want to extend it to 90 seconds or 120. Uh, but it's really good, um, 
or 60 minutes maybe, <laughs> if, uh, if your students are still learning. Um, it's a great way to expand a student's vocabulary, to make them think about different words. Um, if you're a science teacher, for example, uh, this is a great one for, say, picking a theme. You've just studied, um, I don't know, photosynthesis and you want to come up with a conversation where the students are in an arboreum or they're plant biologists or something like that, that's a good one to throw in some specialist terms. It's great for revising, uh, especially if you've got subject-specific terminology, the sciences, the mathematics, uh, languages, any, any subject really. Um, it's a great way of getting them to use those words in context. Uh, really helps improve understanding. So I guess that could work. All right. Anything else? All right. Last chance? Well, thank you very much. I'm very glad. Um, I hope you had a, an interesting learning experience, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope that this has given you something to think about later and use in class. Uh, we're coming up to about eight minutes to the hour. Um, thank you very much. You have been a wonderful audience. Have a lovely day.